and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard, I will be your host for this evening. And uh, tonight's episode is going to be um, be a bit of a playful gnome, but watch out for the runicas. And uh, <laughs> I know why it's called that, <laughs> and you will know why it's called that, because joining me tonight from the playful gnome is a gentleman by the name of Callan Sargent. So, good evening, Callan. Good evening. How are you? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a good eight and a half. I'm bordering. I'll, I'll take I'm, that. I'm bordering a nine. If I'm being perfectly a nine. honest, it's it's been a good. That's couple, impressive. It's been a good couple of days. You know. Excellent. I'm quite. I'm quite happy. Um, I've actually just I've changed my setup tonight. Um, in terms of the the audio setup, so. What I'm, what I've done is I have unfortunately I've taken my normal Ben Kenobi Lego model and uh, I've put him out to pasture and tonight oh. in, tonight instead I'm just going to take a quick picture of this in honour of um, all things that have the ability to transform I've brought in Mr Optimus Prime so fantastic. <laughs> So I might just I might just share that with you on Skype, or I might just stick it out there on the Tinter webs because I always try and take a picture of when we record. Now, for awesome. people that people that are joining us for the first time, hello, thank you for joining us. Um, the reason that we do this is because we need another joke, and <laughs> we're scouring the universe to get one. But in the meantime, we still believe that there is quite simply not enough podcasts out there about tabletop, card games, board games, RPGs, LARPing, and all that good stuff. Um, and the second reason that we um, do this is because um, it's always good to chat to new people. And Callan had a Kickstarter campaign um, recently, Runica. And he is going to be relaunching that in the next couple of months. Um, and we're just coming on to have a chat. And yeah, tell so. us a little bit more about the game. Tell us a little bit more about himself. And, uh, you know, and uh, and we like, it's always good to, to speak to somebody new. Um, so as we say, what we do when we do this is we like to have a little, um, we'll have a little joyous peek at the past. We'll have a little playful peek, um, look at the present. And then we'll have a laughable glance into the future, um, and I just want to find out a little bit about your um, your history with the hobby. If you want to, maybe step back and start at the beginning. Awesome. Well, um, I'll tell you what. I can tell you where the name "The Playful Gnome" comes from. That'd be a good start. Um, it's uh, a long-running uh, campaign using. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. A Beyond the Wall rule set uh friends of mine we play a, an rpg okay uh and my character is a gnome rogue mage and uh it's it's just something that's come from that the little uh logo that we use is what i with my rudimentary artistic skills have uh mocked up as how i envision the playful gnome to be within the campaign his name is keegan okay. um but that's that's where our our title has come from um Jeez. so I have a little bit of a history in RPGs and a slightly longer history in playing board games. Where do the um, do you do voices? Let's step back to Keegan. Do you do do you give a Keegan a voice when you play them? <laughs> well, Keegan uh, has has my voice, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it, it's quite lucky that if I'm honest, I was I was I was quite fortunate that that was the case. You managed to pick a character from round about your area in the country. Exactly. Because where are you, exactly. whereabouts are you, roughly? I'm in the southeast. I'm in Ashford in Kent. Oh, okay. So that's good. It's good that you get gnomes, rogue, <laughs> rogue mage <laughs> gnomes. <and that. laughs> exactly. And playful ones at that. <laughs> Pretty. tell me where you're from, rogue. Um, <laughs> Kent, uh, just uh, not too far from the, um, you know, the, the Channel Tunnel. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... <laughs> This is going to be one of those nights. I've got red juice. To, I've got red juice tonight. And you know what that means? It's food colouring, <laughs> Callan. Food colouring, <laughs> and I always have a bad reaction to it. Um, c- uh, cardboard wise, then you, you said you started off in board games. Where did you first kind of um, hit the cardboard, as they would say? 
Well, I think I, I, since I was little, I obviously played all the classics with my family and always enjoyed those. Um, and in terms of strategy, I used to play, uh, a little bit of chess with my dad and I always quite enjoyed that. And he was, he's one of those dads that doesn't let you win. <laughs> he's competitive dad, is he? As, uh, yeah, and I, I sort of valued it, if I'm honest, because uh, I always, I, when I first won, I felt good about it because I knew it was actually my own victory, <laughs> um, because it had taken such a long time. Uh, after after that, it was um, just sort of scouring. I played sort of trading card games yeah. um, that I've enjoyed, and then I think my first foray into non-traditional, I suppose, board games, although I think it's become a bit of a staple now... It was pandemic. You and me uh, both, and and it, I, th- I think I mean it has become a, a traditional game now, a staple now. But back when I played it, it, it just wasn't one that you that you saw on everyone's shelf, and it was uh, that that was really cool, uh, especially the cooperative element. I just hadn't seen that before, and that sort of piqued my interest. Um, a friend of mine, uh, actually Robin, another part of the playful gnome. Uh, has been a Kickstarter fiend for a long time. And so he's been introducing me to games after games after games uh, and sort of fed the habit a little bit. Um, but I think, yeah, probably on cardboard, it was Pandemic that really started it. The one thing yeah. I like about Pandemic is that you lose it. It's not <laughs> It's not a game where you get the you get the line, especially for this traditional board game where you get... And the, the, op- the object of the game and the winner of the game is the first person to... Blah blah blah. The, the kind of yeah. the rule for pandemic is, and the winner is the game is the person that doesn't die and wipe out the entire world's population, and you have to find a cure. And <laughs> it was, um, I don't know if it, if this was the same. It was the fact that the the pandemic um, doesn't like you. No, but I loved that. Yeah, I absolutely loved that, and and I loved the idea that I was playing this game, I was losing, and then I had to play it again. And it was, it had that video game feel, I think, which I've always enjoyed video games as well. And I think other board games up until that hadn't captured that in the same way that I'd played anyway. I'm sure there were some that existed, but Pandemic had that feel where I got beaten by the boss. Yes. And I had to go back and I had to work out a new strategy and I had to take different characters with me, work out the best way to do it. And I loved that. I really enjoyed that. And, um, that replayability that came from the desire to beat the system. I loved it. Enjoyed it. Pandemic's a funny one because, and Pandemic is another one of these games that's almost like Catan in Carcassonne in terms of how it gets rolled out as a staple. But let's give give a couple of minutes to Pandemic because there will be people that have heard of Pandemic Legacy, which is obviously very very much loved and pandemic's yes. legacy season two is just around the corner and there's a lot of people talking about that with real excitement um since they've heard the kind of the potential backstory for it but pandemic is about the um people that don't wash their hands um that <laughs> basically sneeze and cough without covering their mouths um people that kind of pick their nose um, probably people that um, park in um, mother and baby spaces when they shouldn't. It's, the t- <laughs> it's these general people that yes. kind of go about spreading diseases because there's basically there's there's diseases that have taken over the that are starting to take over planet Earth, and you are a member of a team, and your idea is to basically come up with a cure, yeah. and everybody has a specialist role. Um, I can't remember all of them. Maybe you can. <laughs> do you know? Do you remember them? Um, it's been a while. You have yeah, obviously your while. medic, your medic going around actively curing the diseases. Yep. You have sort of uh, the, a leader position. I can't remember what the terminology is in the yep. game. Uh, are able to sort of give actions to the other characters. Yeah. Um, and you've got uh, sort of. Uh, an infrastructure character that's able to set up posts in different parts of the world yes. to enable quick travel and things like that. Yes. But it's, it's, it's sort of very, fairly traditional roles, um, but finding the sweet spot when you've only got two or three players is, uh, mm, is good tricky. fun. It's a tricky one. The thing, the best thing about it is that you, um, it's card based and it's card based, but it's resulting in chance because you have a deck of cards. 
and basically what will happen is uh, you'll, you'll draw cards of cities around the world and these cities around the world allow you to do things like fast travel to those cities but more importantly once you gain um, the, the, the countries of the world or the areas of the world are split up into colours and once you gain five cities I think it is of a particular colour you can then look at um, covering basically getting that disease kind of sorted out yeah um, and and that, I mean that is the that is the I that's the kind of the general idea. But in that deck are these um, horrific um, is it ep- epidemic cards? Yeah, you've got this sort of outbreak scenario, and uh, that's one of my favourite things where you start placing your virus down, your cubes down to represent the the spread of this virus, and when you hit critical mass in different cities, it starts to spill over, and you can get these horrific plays where one card triggers a massive train chain reaction all across the board and and it and it's scary you're playing it and it's it's scary because you you sort of see it building and then suddenly there's this spill and it <laughs> and it's i think it's brilliant it's fantastic it's a chain reaction when you've got you've got you're like no not beijing Anywhere but Beijing. Anywhere. Exactly. Anywhere but Beijing. Oh, it's Beijing! Oh. And then you've got like three cubes of Beijing and then you've got three cubes somewhere else. You've got three cubes of yeah. other places and you're just like... And then as soon as... If you get more... End up putting your fourth cube in a place, you basically end up spreading or adding a cube to every city that surrounds that That's it. city. And then if those tip over, then you can get up like a chain reaction. So the idea is you've got to cure kind of (laughs) stop the city from getting more infected where at the same time kind of balancing your city cards to make sure you can put a cure together at the same time making sure that everybody's got the right resources and avoiding kind of like these outbreaks because if you get once you get so many outbreaks you're dead this is it nobody it's not like you stop and say okay everybody count up your money and everybody count up your car you know it's not like kind of being at school where everybody gets a medal nowadays just for you know you're be you're getting a medal for being you and yeah no it's brutal it's brutal especially when it's your first experience of that kind of game yes i mean there are there are other games around and i'm sure some of them probably do it even better but as a first experience of a game like that it was it was a brutal experience yeah absolutely I, I had my kids playing Pandemic, and uh, I, I think it was the first game that, as I say, I think I've said this a couple of times, as soon as we played the first game, and they lost, because <laughs> that's generally what will happen, it's yeah. like, do you want another game? And it's like, yeah. Yes, <laughs> stick, absolutely. Stick the cards back on, let's get the, you know, let's get yeah. the cubes all together, let's get a rock and roll with this yeah. and see, see kind of where it goes. But but this time let me take the medic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want the coordinator yeah. kind of guy. You know, yeah, I want, that's you know, it. You know I, I want to be able to, to kind of travel around the world without having to use a travel card or something like that. It was all, if you haven't played it, it's probably one of these games you can get pretty cheap now, I would reckon, now that Legacy has kind of, um, has kind of uh, taken over as the staple because you can play Pandemic Legacy as normal pandemic, allegedly. So I've been oh, told. Okay. So there you go. Um, did you? I mean, um, moving on from that. So that's a nice little side. But then that's what we like to cover because there'll be people sitting there going, "People are talking about pandemic, and I've no idea what pandemic is. Please help me." <laughs> kind of thing. What did you move? I mean, what are you um, playing at the moment? Is there anything that you've been kind of getting to the table at the moment that you've been really kind of liking, putting some time into? Well, actually, with uh, with my sort of current available groups of friends, we we quite like our sort of social deduction games. Okay. So we've we've been playing a lot of things like uh, Spyfall, and uh-huh. we like the Avalon uh, version of Resistance, uh-huh. and the One Night games and things like that. We 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 enjoy sort of picking out the traitor in the group, uh, lying through our teeth at each other. Um, so that's that's been quite a lot of fun. And then we have then I have a my regular meet up where Keegan comes out. <laughs> Uh, out to play, uh, yeah. So that that's my main staple at the moment is is those sort of social deduction games. I think the uh, during a busy term time, it's uh, it's easy to pick up a quick couple of games like that, mm. and then uh, and then my set aside Thursday evening uh, to explore the world as a playful gnome. 
<laughs> I would like to point out that the reason that Callan is talking about turn time isn't because he's a fourteen-year-old high school student. No, no. <laughs> what are you? Are you? A, are you a secondary or are you? A... I am indeed. Yes, yeah, secondary maths teacher in the UK. And that's where we end the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. I it. just, you know what I mean? Negative numbers, mate. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. Do you know what I mean? I cannot possibly have negative juice in my glass. <laughs> There's, you know, I can understand that I'm looking at a waveform just now as we're recording on Audacity. And I understand that the, the levels between it are rising between 0.5 and 1 and minus 0.5 and minus 1. Okay, I tell you, negative numbers ruined. <laughs> this, this is me on the couch. I'll tell you what it was. Right, I was off. Um, I think I was off for like two weeks in high school. Um, I don't know what I had. I think I probably had the flu, or I might have even had chicken pox, or probably just boredom. But um, <clears throat> <clears throat> that was the two weeks that I missed. Um, the two weeks I missed was the two weeks that they started covering negative numbers. And it completely messed up my entire mathematical academic career. Oh no. Do you know um was it do you know the film uh was it um Goodwill Hunting? Yes. Do you know how he just looks at stuff and thing he's on the board and goes and that's it and he just looks at stuff and he gets it, yeah? Yeah, yeah? that's all. See on the alternative side of the universe there was me <laughs> going about going what does negative one mean? And I didn't even have a scientific calculator, so I couldn't even put negative one into my calculator. If I ever tried to do like a negative calculation, I had to take zero and then minus something. And I couldn't yeah. do that because the calculator was so rubbish. I couldn't put zero minus something. I had to put one and then I had to add an extra number on top of it. And it still didn't work all the time. So negative numbers, eh? It's um, still a bit of a killer. It is still a bit of a killer. I just, I can't even. I'm getting uh, my eyes started twitching. I can't even. Um, I feel like we should move on for fear of. Uh, I think we should. You getting flashbacks. <laughs> um, is there anything you've seen recently that um you like the look of then? Uh, games to come out. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, I'm quite looking forward to getting my copy of Subterra. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was lucky. I was lucky enough to be at uh, UKGE with Inside the Box, and so I. I've had my sneak peeks, and and I'm looking forward to getting that because I know it's going to fit brilliantly into my games group. So did you? Um, did you? Were you down at the? Were you down helping? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, I was there helping. Yeah, yeah. I've. Uh, <clears throat> I say. I. I think. ITB has been my sort of insight into this world. But previously, I just played games, and I didn't realise there was this whole community oh. of uh, cardboard fanatics. And uh, I sort of happened across their game jam back in February where a few people were getting together. And because we were looking at trying to put together our game, I thought, mm. yeah, we'll go along. And some, met some fantastic people and got this sort of uh, window into this world. Um, so they have a place in my heart now. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. Um, is Peter's beard as bushy? As he pretends it is. Oh, bushier. Bushier. Is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are small animals living in there. I was convinced for a while it was very bushy, and then I thought for a while potentially it was fake. Uh, well, he wears it well. If it is if it is a beard wig, he wears it very well. Does he? We'll have to have yeah. a discussion. So I'll have to have a discussion where he's back on to um, <laughs> later on, if he's coming on to talk about... Um, about Newspeak. So did it give you um, did it give you a good angle to, you know, with your own project then? Did you have you did you learn quite a lot when you were talking to Peter? Did I take it you must have talked quite a lot of shop? Uh, yeah, and it wasn't just Peter, the 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 sort of people around him as well, um everybody helping out. I it's, it's just getting as many different opinions and and sort of points of view and ideas as possible. Mm-hmm. Um there's I mean I've had to learn so much just to get to the point of not succeeding on a Kickstarter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's been it's been absolutely crazy, and 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 one of the things that sort of helped with with ideas is just the sheer number of people I've spoken to, the the ideas they'll give, the the sort of 
points of reference. I mean, I've, I think I've learned most of the staple names in the community now to, to look to for initial advice. Um, but it, it's been helpful just chatting to everyone. Anything from which manufacturers I should be talking to, yeah. um, to just how much, uh, hassle shipping is going to be, <laughs> um, to, actually who will play test and and have a look at the game and and have a go and give me some feedback and things like that and and it's just building this community and building a little bit of a network trying to to meet and talk to as many experienced people as possible and learn as much as possible what makes a man like yourself um helping children with maths sitting down being the norm <laughs> To then sitting there and going, actually, do you know what? Um, I should give this a crack. Kind of what? What, what was the inspiration? Well, uh, if there's a few of a few of my friends and I. We've we've always sort of made up games. So Runica is not really new. Um, it's it's a game that we put together a few years ago that we um, just sort of mocked up with with card and and played and um, we enjoyed it, but didn't really go anywhere or take take it anywhere okay um and we've done i've done the same with um sort of chess variants and um i'm very much when it comes to rpg for example i'm very much a fan of a sandbox style i just like the creating anyway and i've always yeah. done a little bit of writing um sort of fantasy writing and that sort of thing so i'm i'm sort of all round nerd and <laughs> it it just sort of is something like i say we've always done and i think where we saw sort of Kickstarter doing so well and, and this sort of massive boom in tabletop and, and also I think being a teacher, I've seen problem solving skills and strategic thinking not always, not, are not always natural. Yeah. And, and one of the big reasons I think I learned some of those skills was from playing games. And actually, when you talk to a lot of the teenagers of today, they're not playing, they're not sitting down and playing games with their friends. They're, they're shooting stuff yeah. on, on the computers, which I've no issue with. I, I do the same. Yeah. Uh, but, but for some of them, they don't know how many cards are in a traditional deck of cards or what the suits are. And they've not played even things. And I'll get probably shot for mentioning it, but things like <coughs> Monopoly and, and that sort of thing. Not, not Monopoly's not fine. No, no, Monopoly's fine. Um, I've been seeing recently um, Monopoly Gamer. I've seen that. I don't know if you've seen that. That's no, I've not, ma- I've not seen. Uh, I, I don't know if it's getting a UK release, but it's basically Monopoly based around the um, Mario franchise. And ah, okay. it's got power-ups and such. Like It's in, it's in, it's in America's Ah. At the moment, but uh, whether it's going to be coming over here, I have no idea whatsoever. I'll have um, to look it up. Have you ever been tempted to take some look at maths from a board gaming point of view? Then, have you ever been tempted to, to do an exercise based around using kind of board game principles and stuff like that, just yeah. to kind of mix the stuff? Have you done that before? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, I, I think sometimes the easiest way to, to get, uh, kids to learn is to trick them <laughs> into learning. Um, and so using board games, um, and that sort of competitive strategic nature, something that they don't realize is necessarily practicing any mathematical skills. Yeah. Um, but, but really is. And it can be as simple as sort of, uh, times tables and things like that, but just put in a, in a sort of board, in a game concept or actual abstract sort of algebra they can do again in a, in a game setting. I think, um, uh, I think it's really useful and I think lots more people are doing it. It's, it's not just avid board gamers, but I think teaching in general is, is sort of veering towards, um, trying to include gamification a little bit. Yeah. I think it's giving kind of practical examples of when you would be using something. From, yeah. a theoret- from a theoretical um, viewpoint, I guess, getting all deep and wordy <laughs> as we go on. But no, I'm always interested in some, you know, someone like yourself has to get over an idea or a theory of how something works or the practicalities of how somebody works and put them into from something that's very abstract, let's face it, like numbers are quite abstract. Yeah. And getting it from 
the blackboard into the back of somebody's mind and giving them the practical applications that they can use it as well. I find that kind of fascinating. And I see from simple Dungeons and Dragons, you know, oh, you've got a modifier on there that that does this. And then are you going to make that role for, say, charisma? Are you going to make that role for intimidation? And the guy looks like that and says, well, actually, I've... They do statistics behind it and they do a probability guess behind it and then they'll have to automatically do their math, you know, their yeah. calculations behind that as well. So that kind of all rolls into things and that's when you realise, actually, that math teacher was right. I do use math <laughs> on a day-to-day basis. I mean, especially, especially that sort of number work. I mean, some of the more abstract bits and pieces is a little bit harder for, for people yeah. to visualise in their, their own day-to-day lives. But, but Almost all board games you're playing are numbers of some kind. Yes. There and and even if you're not having to worry about them, the person that designed the game did. Yes. And yes. and and it's always there. And I think that it's not just uh, that though. I think one of the things, especially with the way sort of current exams are changing, and and especially in the UK, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but they are veering a lot more towards problem solving. So just recall of facts is not. Is not not enough anymore for the kids to be able to show that they understand it. They have to be able to solve worded, more complex problems, and actually just getting them to attempt them sometimes with the confidence issues that exist, it can be really hard. Whereas a game, when it's a game and it doesn't have that same loaded pressure, yeah, uh, I find they're much more willing to to try and to to give it a go and to fail. Yeah, and I think it, knowing in a board game it's okay to fail because you just play again and hopefully you try and win next time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think sometimes that message actually can be quite powerful as well. As long as you do get up and you do try again. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's, uh, uh, this side of things is fascinating to me. I mean, I spoke, um, a while ago to, um, Justin Morgan Davies from Bad Cat Games. And he, oh, okay, yeah. uh, he takes a lot of, um, he does actually, Goes in with board games and kind of gets the kids involved and finds it extremely kind of useful uh, in terms of kind of getting messages and ideas and stuff like that kind of across. Yeah. Um, but b- back to and and Runica is now yes three miles away <laughs> down the road. We have veered slightly. Ah, veering's fine. It's your night, Callan. It's your <laughs> night. You know what I mean? I got asked this today. Um. Can you give me an idea of the type of questions you're going to ask? I says, no, there are no questions. <laughs> it's a chat. It's not We're how going it works. on a journey. And where we end up, nobody knows. It'll be the X Factor quarterfinal, probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, Runica. Yes. So, you have tried out with your friends. You've put it all together with your mates. You're getting to the point where you're thinking, actually, we've got something here. Um, let's put it out there and see what happens with it. What's the game about? What is yeah? Do you want to give us a rundown for people that haven't yeah, you know, absolutely heard about it? Do you want to kind of introduce us into the world of uh, Runica? Okay, so Runica is a card game. It's a trick collection card game. So the aim of the game is to collect uh, one particular type of rune or a whole set of different runes and the way you do that is you uh, spend resources to complete trials Uh and the reward for completing those trials is the runes. Um, The biggest sort of mechanic or the the most prominent mechanic in the game though is that you will very rarely be able to complete those trials on your own. Uh, So resources wise it's unlikely on most rounds that you will have enough of the resource required uh, to get the reward and you will have to sort of pull in your opponents the people you're trying to beat uh, to try and help you and you are bartering away the reward so there may be two runes available as a reward and you might go in on the resources 50 50 um, they however might see that there's a penalty if you don't complete the trial and mm. they might demand both the runes just for helping you out so that you don't have to pay the penalty and and the most fun comes from this sort of back and forth conversation people trying to work out is this helping me more or my opponent more (laughs) and trying to balance up the risk of discarding runes and making them available to the other players and trying to work out i i can't decide i'm just going to go for it even if it does help them out 
and then the most pure infuriating thing when you give them the win. Um, and it's, and that's the most fun of the game. So this, this trick collection card game really is actually quite simple. There's, there's, there's not too much to it. You have to collect four different runes and once you've got them, you win. But it's that mechanic of trying to work out who am I doing the most favours? Them or me? Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things I've noticed sometimes about kind of the trick collecting games or games where you're building up sets of stuff to win is there's very little there's always options to bargain but it's not essential and there's a lot of games out there where you could quite happily win through the completely through the luck of the cards that are drawn without having to even speak to the player kind of to the left or you're to the right of you yeah, that's 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 um, that's not Runica. Unfortunately, you're going to have to talk to the players around you, and then you're going to have to come to some agreement at some point, uh, e- even if uh, reluctantly. <laughs> no, I mean it's good to, if you're forcing the kind of the interaction. If you're forcing people to actually sit there and have a conversation and say, "I'll uh, I'll go fifty fifty with you." Um, I mean, how many times have you played it now? You must have played it tons oh. of times. I, I I don't even know. Um, I hundreds maybe. <laughs> it's, it's been played a lot. <laughs> it's um, yeah, and it, <laughs> I, I haven't even counted. Um, it's especially because it was the game existed. I say before we decided to go anywhere with it. Yeah. Um, so we used to just play it because it was a nice quick game that we enjoyed playing, and it came out and uh-huh. it was in a sort of makeshift. Uh, box with elastic band around the cards inside and it was it was just sort of put together because we enjoyed it and we had the idea um so it's had a lot of play um, and and what you get? Yeah, sorry sorry, sorry. Oh, on you go no i was just gonna say it's it's probably had more revisions and changes since we've begun this idea of kickstarter uh, and actually putting it out there and making it available for people um with more and more people sort of test playing it for us and mm-hmm. people um, doing it without our input um, just just to get an idea of how the rules sound and, and how that changes. So there has probably been more changes then than there was from the very initial idea uh, way back when, just in the last few months. Is it, um, <clears throat> when you're putting together a rule book, is it difficult to put together a rule book when you know the rules and all your f- friends know the rules that have been playing the game? Did you get kind of feedback on the instructions that you were giving people? Yeah, that, that's been a part of the feedback and clarification. As soon as someone asks a question when they've yeah. already had the rule book, then I know there's something needs to change in the rule book. Yeah. Um, so as soon as there's a question, I'm making a note and then I'm making a revision. Um, but I think I started the, the way I started with writing the rules was just to say, what would my spiel be? If I'm sitting there with the cards in front of me talking to someone, what is it I'm saying to them? And we just tried to formalise that and get that down. And then I say it's been revisions after people have still asked questions or a scenario has come up that just is one in a million scenario and we've we've not accounted for it. And then that's had to go in and, and mm. maybe we've made changes. Um, so it's it's largely been a, a sort of a repetitive process of, of adding and changing and rewording. Um, just to answer the little questions or, or the little bits where people are unsure. So is the rule book bigger than the actual deck of cards now? Uh, no, we still managed to keep it concise. It, yeah. it still fits over a, a couple of pages of A4. That's um, so it, it doesn't really add to the size of the box or anything like that. But it, it's it's just the revisions more than anything. A slight rewording. Just trying to make it uh, clear. But yeah. Uh, and are you, are you, is it your responsibility to put the, the real book together? Have you, are you still work, you, I think you're working, collaborating with your, your friends to put everything together. So are you the guy that's the main person that's steering things? Or do you uh, kind of split the rules between everybody? Um, jobs get split and, and, and sort of delegated out between, between all of us. Um, but the, it's all on my PC. It's, it's all there. I'm sort of the main go to. I think originally it was, just me setting up because the the playful gnome was originally going to be set up for me to work on a different game. Oh, right. um, uh, but that game uh, is a miniatures um, sort of tower defense sort of, um, 
and it's a much bigger project. And I think for our first project going into that, where we would have required um, pledges of sort of 60, 70, 80 to be able to do it. Yeah. It, it seemed, it seemed a bit much to go in and, and previously it would have been fine. But when Kickstarter mm. was sort of napkin ideas that people loved the concept of and then just threw money at it, it would have been fine. But now people want a finished product before it's, it's even started. So that, most most projects now, when you look on Kickstarter, the successful ones are ones that are pretty much ready to go to print. Yes, and we didn't have the funds to to put all of that together to get the modelling done for the figures and to get all of the artwork done uh, for the scale of the game. So so we went back to this game that we already had that we loved playing that was a little smaller game that required much less initial investment to get it to a point where it was actually ready to print. Um. So because I started that other one and then brought uh, Robin in when we were talking about using Runica, um, it's largely been my startup and then other people have come in to sort of help out and give the ideas and yeah. Do you have a working uh, version of your tower defense game then? I have a, in a sort of a little box of counters and cards and scrap yeah. paper. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a, a working version but by the time it actually gets to the point of, of doing something uh with that and, and bringing that to to fruition uh i envisage it being different to what it is now you got big plans uh if this goes well then yeah, yeah then yeah <laughs> uh it, it it could be it could be fantastic at the moment it's okay it's good yeah. um but it, it could be fantastic but it, it it will require a lot of time um and and a fair bit of investment before we even get to the Kickstarter point. So we'll see. So here's um here's a question for you, being in the situation um that you were. Yeah. Um do you think that and you, do you think that basically that Kickstarter they should consider maybe splitting Kickstarter a little bit? between the really experienced big box guys and guys like yourselves that are actually really kind of arg- arguably using Kickstarter for the original reason it was there in the first place? Uh, it's tempting to say yes, because I would like it to be... Uh, I would like to have to provide less in the beginning to yes. be able to do it, because, you know, we all would. But I, I think it still is what people want. Uh, they're, they're putting money towards things that they want and that won't exist necessarily without it. And even if that is a big box company, I, I think they're just using it in the same way we all would were we in that position. I don't think splitting it off um, is as fair as it sounds initially. Yeah, I think, I, I think we've had this. I've had this conversation so many times and there's the argument that if you split it off would people follow the big box games anyway? So yeah. nobody be nobody would be any better off, and the bigger guys would get their money. Or would it be the case that people will still, you know, you know, it's it's a case of it. Well, it needs to be together because that's one of some of the reasons that people go to Kickstarter. And sometimes when they look at the big box stuff, they'll check out the other stuff which Kickstarter is saying is kind of like available this is it i think it's a it's a sort of double-edged sword in the way the the big campaigns detract the attention that would be there anyway they will pull a little bit but they will also bring a lot of attention to kickstarter that wouldn't have been there anyway yeah and and so i don't know that they're necessarily taking more from the little guys than they're bringing in in the first place yeah Um, yeah so no i as much as I say, it would be nice for me to just be able to bring my napkin idea and raise all the funds to do it. I I see the I do see the value in in having to put the work in and get it to a point. Uh, the only the only thing I would say is we're quite lucky that we could put a little bit of money in and get some of the artwork and bits done so that there is something pretty to show people. Yeah. And I think there will be plenty of people that are in a situation where they have a sterling idea but they've n- zero funds. Yeah, and that is a shame. Because yeah. it's unlikely now in Kickstarter as it is today that 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 will that that will get funding, but I don't know if that's enough to say it should be split. 
It's, I mean, it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? I mean, these things yeah. genuinely will will evolve naturally. Um, and I mean, I guess the thing is, if you're wanting to, an idea is a good idea, but if you want to, I guess, push that idea, then there's certain things that you need to do. It's, as I say, it's a strange, it's always a strange situation because there will be people that will come to Kickstarter and all they'll back as a, a Simon game. There are yeah. other people that will come to Kickstarter and they'll back a small game. There will be small games out there that all of a sudden will end up doing six figures on Kickstarter, like, you know, um, um, Legends Untold, for instance, you know, Kevin yeah. Young's game. Um, yeah. You know, I think also, um, like I say, that there will be another sort of subsection of people that come because of ki- they're like, come on, and then, or how, what do you say, Simon? Yeah, and then just, I don't know what it could be. I read it as "come on" because that's how I would abbreviate it in a text, <laughs> exactly. and that, that's so that's in my head. I can't get away from that. Um, but anyway, there will be people that come for them, but but they do explore. Yeah, and so I think that there's there's a massive value in that as well. So I I wouldn't like to see them go. Yeah, and you get these as I say, you get these accidental heroes coming along. I mean, yeah. let's face it, Gloomhaven was one of them. Yeah, although there's a hell of a lot of work going into that, yeah, to to build the build the brand before it got to Kickstarter. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, fantastic job. I mean, I, that was incredible. And it? I mean, then you look at Frank's uh, City of Kings as well. Ah, oh, Frank, and that was incredible. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. I mean, the game looks stunning, but it it was all the work. He was around for a long time, and and he put a lot of himself into that, and. It's come to fruition. I mean, it worked. It, it did what it needed to do. Absolutely. Um, so, no, I think I think there's still opportunities for the little guys. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the, the angry, the angry equality officer inside me wants to jump on a soapbox and say that's it. It should be fair for everybody. And then the other side of me says, yeah. but it'd be less fun. <laughs> it, would be, it would be less fun. Um, yeah. Going back to your campaign, um, yes. Was I mean, um, how many did you learn a whole pile of lessons from that first campaign? Yeah, and that was kind of the reason we did it. Um, I'd learned enough from talking to so many people and doing trying to do as much research as I could that that said if I go now, there's a good chance it's not going to hit the goal. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there was more to learn, and we knew that we knew that we didn't have an understanding of the sort of the processes of actually running the campaign mm-hmm. um, and what that entail, like what, what that meant in terms of people getting in contact, commenting and giving feedback, the sheer number of messages I would get from people who could get me all of my funding straight away with their various social media accounts and things was incredible. Um, I didn't realize that there were so many influential people out there, but it was in all fairness, I just sent you the one email. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I, I mean, you've probably been told this a thousand times, but I got so much. Like, I was getting, I was getting sort of 10 or 15, and that's probably quite small, um, you know, because we're, we're only little really, uh, 10 or 15 a day of people who were telling me just how amazing their social media marketing skills were, and, um, that they could get me onto the, the, the top 12 on the Kickstarter page and, and to their 10,000 groups each with a million followers. And, oh, it was incredible. <laughs> but these are all things I wasn't aware of and I didn't realise. And um, even things like the way the campaign was structured on the page, uh, all my research said very few people actually bother watching the videos. Yeah. But if you don't put the videos there, everybody notices. Yeah, exactly. And that was, it was things like that. So we, we sort of rushed together these really bad videos, um, because everybody was noticing that there were no videos there, even though when I'd read forum after forum and looked at stat pages after stat pages, so many people didn't bother watching the videos. Um, <laughs> but actually there's enough there that want it and at least want to know that you've put in the effort and taken the time to create it. Exactly. That it, it's worth doing. And, and so it's, it's lessons like that. And it's been also very useful for getting the word out because it's, it's given me, um, sort of contacts, uh, people to speak to like yourself and, and people to play test and review and things like that that I didn't have before. Um, so 
I think rather than sort of looking at it as a failure, it's made me very sure that we can make a success of it. I think you have to go through these things because you can pretty much do everything that you are supposed to on paper. Yeah. And then it's sometimes Kickstarters, it's just not the right time. No, this is it. Take is Mar- it. I mean, um, Mark, um, uh, Mark at Orange Nebula, who was on the show the other week. Yeah. And he ran Epoch, and he cancelled Epoch within the first couple of weeks because he didn't think... It just wasn't kind of getting the momentum. It wasn't going anywhere. He, he thought he was doing everything right. He didn't think there was you know much he could kind of change. Um, and then he's kind of, you know, gathered himself up, went about, went about it, approached it, you know, approached it slightly differently. But you can't tell how you've kind of approached this. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a massive change. The, no, this is the thing. Like now, we'll go into this, and I will be sending out a message. There were 137 people that put their their pledge in for the first campaign. Yeah. Which doesn't sound like a lot to many people, but for me that was incredible. There are the, there's, there's 137 people who are willing to put some money towards making this happen. So I, I was super happy with that. And then I know that not all, but a chunk of those people are there because we've had messages saying like, when are you relaunching? Yeah. When's, when's it coming back? You said you were going to relaunch. And, and I've been quite quiet on social media for a little while now because we've been doing a lot behind the scenes to get ready. And over the next few weeks, we'll start to build that again, remind people we're still here and go back to those original backers and say, look, we're we're coming back and your Mm. support on the first day will make all the bit of difference. And that was a part of it as well. It's a certain amount of strategy to the success of it, appearing on things like kick track on the first day and getting into the top pages because the first day has gone very well, seemed to make a huge difference to how the rest of the campaign pans out. Yeah. And then um, you've got then you've got the um, well, I mean, if you go to the kind of the the popular um, or the ones that seem to be gathering momentum, um, you've got people that are always saying, right, here's the click on the board game geek link, uh, yeah. click on click on click click on a uh, click track. Um, this is what you've got to do today, guys, and that'll get it back up the kind of the interest rating again. So exactly, there are people that seem to be almost semi professional Kickstarter backers, which um, <laughs> yeah. If you've got a couple of them in your corner, it seems to make a hell of a lot of difference. And it does. The interesting thing, I mean, you mentioned, you know, obviously F- um, Frank. Hello, Frank. Um, <laughs> who I was speaking to the other night, actually, um, who's going to be coming back on again um, soon. And, awesome. Uh, and uh, he was. I mean, there was a lot of people that that were in the City of Kings campaign that have transferred across to the epoch campaign and you see yeah. them all you see them all talking away to each other in the comments going oh i know you <laughs> that's <laughs> you know? the thing the, the communities that build in the kickstarter oh, yeah. comments are, are incredible and there are so many awesome people there with awesome ideas as well and i think um we we learned straight away that we need to listen to these people yeah. uh and there were people just suggesting little ideas tweaks for the campaign page uh, ideas for who to get in contact with and what to do and, and why we shouldn't be doing this or why we should be doing that. And, and they were incredible. Really, really, really helpful. And, and there's already that little bit of a, a sort of a community building. But I mean, obviously not nowhere near, uh, some of the more successful campaigns, but it, but it's really nice to see that and go into the second attempt, the relaunch, knowing that, that that can happen and, and hopefully will again. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, Going back to going back to Runica again. Yep. What's what kind of components when we open the box? Is it a um, what kind of components can we expect to find when we open up the box? Okay, so you'll have uh, your set of rune cards, and these are your collectible. These are your your trick cards that you're collecting. Then we have uh, a deck of loot cards. These are the resource that you will be using uh, to uh, to hopefully enable you to collect the runes. Uh, these resources are sort of traditional fantasy items, uh, items from Norse mythology, um, and they are 
a sort of a little bit tongue in cheek, um, but they're there as as sort of an expendable uh, in the trial deck. So you will get another deck of cards, which are your trials. These will each of them have on them a number um, that your resources need to total in order to gain the reward. And mm-hmm. also uh, uh, details of a penalty should you not be able to meet the requirements by either paying for it yourself or bartering with other people to help you out. Uh, you've also then got uh, what we're calling Raven cards. The Raven cards are end of round sort of group events. Uh, they affect the runes. They affect um, the resources that you have. They affect um, the general play of the whole group. And then lastly, we also have a deck of character cards. The character cards are one-shot abilities that people can use throughout the game um, to affect in some way. And they range from being able to um, draw card, draw a rune from the discard pile, um, which is really nice and powerful, or steal resources from an opponent, um, things like that that allow a, a sort of one-shot disruption to your opponent's game. Um, in the sort of more deluxe version that we were offering and we, we intend to do again we're looking to have physical runes to replace the rune cards okay. um, in a bag of runes so rather than drawing from the rune deck you will put your hand into the bag of runes and draw out runes from there um, which I really love the idea of. Um, we wanted to be able to keep the initial price point down um, so we're offering the the purely card version yeah. but um, but we, we, yeah, we will have these rune version available as well which will be really nice i'm looking forward to that um other things that will happen hopefully will be things like um just a a group leader um token marker um and player mats for the runes and things like that but the main components that will be in the basic one is just this cards that i mentioned what kind of um price are you looking at for all this um goodness uh well we went in uh, on the original Kickstarter, and it's sort of as as low as we can go. Um, is twenty twenty pounds? Um, it was set. Well, that's in the UK. Seventeen with three pounds delivery. Delivery has been, if I'm honest, the biggest factor in trying to organise the price points. Yeah. Um, because the. We've tried to model based off hundreds of other campaigns where the sort of splits of the demographics are and where we think we're going to have to deliver to and yeah. how that's going to pan out in cost, but it, that's not certain. And so it's sort of, it's all a bit of guesswork, really. Um, if we can get the scales up, it, obviously economies of scale mean that we can reduce the price, um, or, or increase the value of the, the 20. Um, if we go high, but we've had to work on a minimum print run as well. So um, 20 at the moment. Okay. Now that's, Ho- um, I mean, hopefully like, what yeah. we'll be able to do, because we've got ideas to make it more, but like better value for money is if we do get the campaign going past the initial goal and into stretch goals, that'll mean that we'll, the cost to us of manufacturing will go down and we'll be able to include more and more for the, for the same price. So most of the stretch goals that we've got are to upgrade and enhance all versions that people will pledge at, um, rather than add in loads of add-ons that people can then spend more money on. Uh, it's to make the initial box better and better value. Yeah, I think that's... Um, I like that. Like, I think that appeals, it appeals to me because I've been down the route of seeing stretch goals where they just pile on more and more stuff and I've ended up with a room full of several boxes which I've just managed to <laughs> I've just managed to break the base game for goodness sake I don't need yeah. I don't need the inflatable dog that also goes on the table <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what we missed out the inflatable dog you should have had the inflatable dog oh well we've, there's still time there is still time listen um I'm, I'm not putting any pressure on but um you know Peter Blenkern He's getting the bearded meeples my way. I'm just saying. I'm not <laughs> the inflatable dog. We'll have to sort something out. You have to do that. The dog of whatever. Yeah, I don't no, know. We, I'm sure we can work something out. Something like that. If they had dogs in your world, the god of dog. <laughs> I'll I'll, con- I'll consult the books or and an infla- see what I can find. Or an inflatable gnome, a playful gnome. Oh, you've got to have a playful. I need that anyway for the office. I, think. I need that. 
You've got to have a playful no meeple. <laughs> For sure. Callan, I think. no, you have to. Okay, all right. I'll you got to say, it. if you get if you get this, when we get this funded, yeah, you have to look into getting a meeple included in every single box that has a little, there's the little sticky, cheeky face gnome on it. That would be awesome. Oh. Okay. It's a promise. Well, I mean, um, uh, Sarah uh, from One Free Elephant has got yes. a One Free Elephant. I'm just saying, I'm not putting any, um, I'm not putting any pressure on you. Are um, you not? I feel like you are. <laughs> just a little bit of pressure. A little bit, a little just bit a of pressure. Tiny bit. Just, I'm just thinking, you know, it's branding. It is. Well, box, this is it. Marketing. Uh, with every this box is it. you get. A free get, playful gnome. Yeah, you get a free playful gnome. And there he is, you open him up, you take him out, and you go, oh, he's playful, isn't he? Oh, a cheeky little chappy. Cheeky little chappy. Um, <laughs> nipping back to postage, because um, you've mentioned getting the balance of that was completely right. Um, Rory, Rory Summer, who's a friend of the show, he was talking about a, a game last night where he's gone through his... Yes. Um, he's gone through his pledge manager... And pretty much the the cost of delivery is um, seventy percent of the pledge. Yeah, I I can see how that happens, especially on first time first time creators. I can see when you don't know what the numbers are going to be and you don't know what to expect in terms of sort of backing. I can I can honestly see how that happens because it's. It's been the most stressful part of it is trying yeah. to organize exactly how that's going to work and the cost. And even on the base one, when we're going to the US, for example, from here, well, it wouldn't be going directly from here, but, but the, we could get it down to maybe sort of nine, ten pounds. Yeah. And that was sort of like 50% of the, of the box. And, it, and that's, we, that was really scary, but it was the only thing we could do. And like I say, that was why I was so hell bent on, on not just hitting the target, but going way beyond yeah. it and being able to make the initial box the the best value uh, and getting the most into that. Because then that, that sort of guilt of having to charge the uh, shipping. But if we don't put it on there, we're, there's no way we'll be no. able to actually deliver on the promise of the campaign. And that that's the issue. Is if, It might be that 90% of our pledges come from the US, which will significantly reduce the cost because we can bulk ship and make a difference but i was really uncertain about doing this whole uh sort of trend of yeah putting the as shipping I say, on I after the campaign um, i think uh, as i said that's kind of bitten a couple of people quite badly kind of later on it it's yeah it's hard i can understand why and for a lot of people that will actually lower the cost of shipping because you can you can make the best decisions with the correct yeah. info there and then rather than trying to predict what's going to happen um but I, for one, when I want to back something, I like the idea that once I've done it, I've done it. And yeah. I don't have to, I know exactly how much it's going to be. And that's yeah. how much I've said. And there's not surprises or changes. Um, the, the, I don't have enough expendable income just to assume whatever yeah. price they then put on at the end and, and say that's okay. So, and I think I'm not, I'm not strange in that, in that idea. I think there's a lot of people in that boat. No, no, at all. Um, yeah. There's nothing, nothing worse than you like hitting next month, and then you'll get a couple of emails saying, "And remember, the pledge manager is closing this month." And you go, "Okay, I'll just check my address." And then it's like, "And here's a uh, twenty-seven dollars to ship it over," and you're like, "Hmm, yeah. okay." Yeah, that's the thing, and so I wanted to avoid that, which meant having to make yeah. predictions on on the delivery. Um, so I'd say, hopefully, we've made the correct decisions. With it, and 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 it's not it's not too much for everyone, but I can understand why some of these other campaigns are uh, sort of seventy percent, especially when you don't have links with big distributors that are willing to take some of that cost for you. I think it's going to take Rory a while to understand. He is still fuming. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, seventy percent is is a lot. <laughs> Is. I think it's especially when you get to the thing where yes, I'm going to get this. This is going to arrive next month. Oh, it's not. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to go and do something. Yeah. <laughs> where's my uh, Where's my bubble wrap? 
<laughs> I need to go and pop. I, I tell go... you what, can I just collect it? <laughs> exactly. I'll just get a plane ticket over to the factory in China and get it my flipping self. <laughs> yeah. No, I do understand how it feels on that end, but I, I say now having to have having to go through it all and, and try and work out where my goal has to be. Because a big chunk of the goal as well on Kickstarter is the delivery cost. Because what's paid in delivery, and you're, again, you probably already know this, yeah. what's paid in delivery forms a part of your main goal. Yeah, absolutely. It's not added on at the end, which means a big chunk of the money you're asking for is trying to know that, right, I've got my minimum manufacture, so my minimum order sample order size, and then... What I think will be the delivery charges on that on that minimum order to get it to all the different parts of the world that it's likely to go to based on how all the other campaigns have done it, and then trying to work out that right because so I think actually our delivery costs make up about forty percent of our pledge our uh, main goal that's um are you doing some maths there? <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, we've got the, the spreadsheets are uh, incredible. Robin is our spreadsheet guy, and he's very proud of them. They're very colourful, and they you change a number and it all updates. And he's, he's he loves it. I don't I um, don't mind as long as you show you're working, Mister. Yeah, Sergeant. exactly that. This is it. <laughs> I don't care how you got to the calculation, but I need to see how you got there. I'm sorry. <laughs> otherwise, you don't get. Otherwise, you only get two out of five. You don't get the full five. I'm sorry. No, no, fair enough. <laughs> um, I know we said kind of earlier on that you're not sure of a the kind of the launch date for the the relaunch of Ronica, which is fine because what we'll do is when we do know about it, we will make sure that we we put it out there on the old social medias as well, which is good. Well, yeah, I'm I'm on my school holidays uh, now. So I will be uh, working uh, night and day to try and get this sorted. I'm hoping uh, that by the beginning of August so that uh, I can actually be attentive to the campaign and not at school whilst it's running as well. Yes. Um, that's that's one thing that is is hurrying me slightly because uh, if, it go, if we wait too long, then uh, I'm going to be um, teaching. And, and Robin, who, who's a part of it, he's a teacher as well. All oh, right. Um, so we're going to be in lessons whilst the campaign's running. So I'd rather do it over the summer and be available. You can imagine that, sir, sir. <laughs> Thought you said there was no mobile phones in class, sir. Thought you said there's no mobile phones. <laughs> you checking Kickstarter, sir? You doing a campaign, sir? You doing a board game, sir? Doing a campaign? <laughs> okay. And I can't yep. think of anything else. To say, do you know what I mean? You doing that, sir? <laughs> that guy's rubbish, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you are doing miniatures, sir. That'll be the question. You're we'll not doing it if you're not doing miniatures, sir. <laughs> not exactly. Game that's rubbish, sir. No miniatures, sir. What is that? Runes? <laughs> you spelt rooms wrong, sir. That's rooms. It's rubbish. In the bag. <laughs> and Seventy percent delivery, <laughs> sir. That's a rip off. <laughs> I'm going home, sir. I'm telling my dad, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so oh, forth. Indeed, ad, indeed. Ad infinite. Do you know what I mean? Are you going to back it or not? Look at my face. <laughs> Look bothered. <laughs> face bothered. Back it bothered. Um. Anyway, if people want to, don't even know where that went. I would struggle to even get it back into the pen again. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> if people want to keep an eye on what's going to be happening with your good selves over the next couple of months. Where do we find you on the internet webs, webs, nets, Mr. Sergeant? Now, if, if I've done all my bits and pieces right, wherever, if you type in the playful gnome anywhere, you should find us. So we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. I say it's quite quiet at the moment because we've been doing a lot of background work, but uh, within the next week or so, we'll be back up and running on the social medias, making uh, many annoying posts and, and uh, appearing in your feeds uh regularly <laughs> sliding into uh, your dms <laughs> oh yes oh yes smooth as anything um yeah so search the playful gnome on facebook on twitter uh, even if you google it you should get the website the playful um it it's all there um i'm not the savviest of social media experts but we do our best do you know do you want to know i've just um i've just googled the playful gnome and <laughs> the first <laughs> Don't, um, I don't want to know what the first thing that came up is. It's not us, is it? 
It is actually you guys. It is. Is it? it? Is. Yeah. It, Excellent. It is. It is. You've got um, well, you've got the playful gnome home Facebook. Um, yep, you're coming up. You've got the home page. Working on two tabletop games. You've got, but then you've got Google Shopping at the top. <laughs> Oh no, what's that? It's probably like garden gnomes or something, isn't it? Vivid Arts Playful Gnome Sun with a Leaf Pad on Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what? I don't mind actually. I quite like that. I like that uh, garden gnomes. I think we should get a playful gnome garden gnome. Cal, and this is going in the show notes, so I hate to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) I have to put a link to this in it because it's absolutely fantastic. It is a gnome playing with an iPad. It is, Amazing. It is so 2017. I can't, <laughs> I can't even talk about it. So, uh, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those good, lovely places. As we say, we will put some, uh, we will put these in the show notes so that we have notes to show. Um, that makes sense. Absolutely, as always. Um, this has been fun. <laughs> It's been it up. has. It's, it has. It's, it's been, been enjoyable. It's been all over the place. Um, oh, but but where would you want to be otherwise? I just I don't know. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, I'm also you know more than halfway through my red juice, so everything is good. Um, <clears throat> but no, thank you for coming along. It's been, uh, uh, thank you for having me. No, I very much appreciate you, you taking the time to have a chat. No, it's always good fun to speak to new people, even though you're a math teacher. Um. <sighs> Now, if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, and um, and thank you for those who do, um, we're kind of appreciating the kind of new people that are listening every day. Um, if you want to keep a track on what we're up to, then just go to Google and search for We Are Not Wizards. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us also at Instagram. You can find us on Stitcher and Speaker and Acast and a whole load of other podcast places as well. Obviously, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, which is apparently the place to be. If you have liked what you've heard tonight, um, we always like a nice little cheeky iTunes review. And as we say, um, as always, don't give us a 10 if you're going to give us a rating. Because that'll make us just big-headed. But don't give us a one. Because that'll make us cry. Give us a five. Because it's in the middle. And it's average. And we are... We're a bit average, really. Oh. (laughs) But That's that's so sad. But it's okay. Because the person that has not been average tonight is... The wonderful, the fantastic, he's slightly cheeky, he's slightly playful, he's slightly roguish, he's slightly magish. It's 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 Callan Sargent. Thank you very much for having me. That's okay. It's been it has been a lot of fun. It's also <laughs> been it's been you know, it's been as they say, it's been in, entertaining and informative from an education. Oh, the best point of, of both view. worlds. The best of both worlds, as Garth said in Wayne's World. Um <laughs> There's only two things, two two more things to do. This juice is kicking in. Um, I can tell. I can, can tell. tell. It's fantastic. Um, good I'd old, like some. Good old cheap juice. That's all I'll say. Um, typical Scotland is that we use juice to name anything at all, even though it's technically <laughs> never been near a fruit in its life. Uh, <laughs> the first thing is to remember that we are many things. But we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Callan? Oh well, I thought so, but I'm glad you've you've uh, cleared that up for me. <laughs> we're um, potentially sitting there about to bargain with somebody because if they don't give us help in the next task, then I'm going to suffer a penalty that's going to mean I can't collect this trick set, which means I'm potentially going to lose the game. I think let, let's let's get to bargaining. There we go. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it is. Um, <laughs> do we do this in the teacher voice? It's a goodbye, Mister Sergeant. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a goodbye from me. Remember, this is really good juice, by the way. Um, stay safe. Roll sixes. 
um, check out Runica when it comes out because it's different. It's um, going to not really cost you much. And it's another idea of what board games and card games and tabletop can potentially be. And um, it's all wrapped up um, with a little playful gnome Meepo that you heard Callan say he's going to get made for the campaign, which is always good. (laughs) (laughs) Do you do this to everyone? Absolutely, without fail. Emotional blackmail. Getting it recorded is the way to go. But (laughs) but until the next time, goodbye. Bye-bye.